Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hope you enjoyed your lunch at what is an unusual time in the uh, Spanish academic timetable. So I can understand if you're hard, in a sort of transitional period um, when it comes to your, your daily routines. Um, it's 2.15, and we are going to begin uh, this keynote session with Davina uh, Frau Meigs and, and David Buckingham. And before we begin, just a couple of points to make. First of all, I have been told by the organization that after today's session, uh, please, those of you who haven't done so already, return your translator and headphones, um, as we're missing a few, I think, out at the back. Secondly, um, just to explain the logistics of what we're going to do right now, um, I'm going to present our two speakers, and they are both going to speak um, more or less around 20 minutes. We'll see how we go. Um, I will then ask them a couple of questions based on what they've said uh, today. But the fun part could be later on when we'll be accepting questions from the audience. So I think I understand that somebody will be passing around a paper for you to ask a question to Davina or to David. So um, please get involved. And if you could write your question clearly and your name and just maybe where you're from. Um, and then we will uh, use our own internal um, algorithms <laughs> and filter the ones that we uh, like the best and throw them at Davina and David to see uh, how they respond. So um, let's get started. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Tullock. I'm a professor of uh, international journalism and global media here at the UPF, and uh, I form part of this quite interesting, you know, sort of pre-intervention chat. We're kind of like parts of the British Isles represented here. I have Scottish ancestry. Davina has uh, Welsh, partly Welsh surname, and David must be our English. I'm a Londoner. Thoroughbred. I'm a Londoner. And. <laughs> With the surname that he's got, if he's not English, then we, can, we may as well just leave. Um, so we are fully represented here. We're just missing the, uh, the Irish contingent, which uh, may come along later. Who knows? So let me present uh, Davina. For those of you who don't know um, her speciality, I'm, I'm going to use the official uh, transcription here in order not to make a mistake. Um, so I hope this is all right, Davina. Davina specializes in content and risk behaviors, as well as questions of reception and the use of information and communications technologies. She's currently working on issues of cultural diversity, e-learning, media education, and media co-regulation, audiovisual aspects and on the internet. She leads the ANR Translit Research Project, which reflects on the epistemology of transliteracy and observes the practices of young people. She's published, as you know, um, multiple texts, uh, those of which are all available on the conference literature. Um, so just let me get to the end to remind you that she's the recipient of the 2016, so this is pretty recent, Global Media and Information Literacy Award, which is spearheaded by the UNESCO Global Alliance for Partnership on Media and Information Literacy, GAP Mill the Media and Information Literacy and Intercultural Dialogue University Network, which has the support of the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. How grandiose does that sound? She's also a founding member of the office of ECREA, which for all of you who are European communication researchers know perfectly well what is that organization. So uh, Davina is going to speak more or less for about uh, 20 and 25 minutes, and you can begin to jot down your questions. Uh, as we go along, so um, it's all yours. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bon dia a tots. Sim molt contenta de veure vos. Ni m'agrada molt vindre a Barcelona cada volta que puc. Um, Trobe que el meu país uh, i de veure moltes cares coneixudes. Hola, Queli. <laughs> Hola, Víctor. Hola a tots vosaltres. Um, I uh, vaig a parlar en anglès, que pareix raro en el Brexit, però 
seguimos se, siguiendo uh, europeos en, una, en, en, en un idioma um, compartido que es el inglés de momento. Uh, un día será el catalán. Um, so I'm, I'm going to switch to, to English for the sake of Christopher and David, uh, but I'm kidding. Um, the uh, the uh, topic um, is important, and thank you, uh, Carlos Escolari. Thank you uh, all um, your team for um, inviting uh, inviting me here for this um, question about um, media and information literacy, trans literacy. You should say trying to figure out where we are. Uh, now that you're finishing your project and uh, starting to have a new life. Um, I'm also finished with several of my projects and I, I know the relief uh, this is. Um, but it's also a moment to ponder, to figure out where we are and where we can go together uh, into the next step, which is why I called my, uh, my speech rapidly <coughs> um, a composite research agenda, because I think we are at a stage now where we can think uh, of the next agenda for mail. The good news is I think we have an agenda for mail uh, because up to now, media and information literacy was um, very much considered as a sub part of communication studies or media studies or whatever. I'm going to try and claim that it's about time to create um, a discipline maybe, uh, some uh, transdisciplinary um, based type of research where all of us can come together for the 21st century um, well-being of our young people, because after all, that's what we're working for. <coughs> where is the, where am I, Oops. this is where my media literacy skills are going to be tested, there. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to speak from a perspective of several research projects that I've been involved in, the European ECHO project, and some people are here from ECHO, ECHFOLI, which is a Mediter Euro Mediterranean with Cyprus and Palestine and Morocco, Translit, uh, which is connected a little bit with transliteracy, uh, and also a research I did with for UNESCO on radicalization of young people. <coughs> uh, so it's a condensation of all these uh, projects that I'm trying to um, uh, present to you seeing changes, new trends, and um, how we can enable each other uh, to move forward uh, with, uh, with mail. And I'm going to go very fast, and that's to make sure you don't fall asleep. Uh, just to establish the ground, um, uh, I think uh, we are uh, all now past this moment, social turn. We're seeing the consequences, uh, the current Facebook crisis, the current uh, fake news crisis for me is a consequence of 10 years of having moved to the social media and the impact of social media on, on the traditional media uh, with um, some elements from the past being uh, gained and some addition uh, being uh, done thanks to social media platforms. So in fact, we find ourselves it seems to me, in this situation right now, a situation that I call the shuttle screen situation, because we are dealing with two screens at the same time, and they are talking to each other. The tube and YouTube, uh, the press, the web. Um, the television type of screen, the, the mainstream mass media screen, is the screen that is still doing the storytelling. Long narrative forms, still them. Here you have short narrative forms. And they're doing the engagement um, with um, uh, comments, uh, particularly. Mm -hmm. So that's a presentation for you to share. And um, uh, for me, we are in facing now new cultural goods, no longer the traditional cultural goods, goods transformed by participation, uh, relational goods, and experience goods, um, which is say the demand side being uh, uh, put forward. It creates screens that. Um, by now are no longer one single spaces, and you, and you know that as you're looking at your own screen. Uh, we still have the office and the studio screen, and that's the TV, cinema screen, the navigation space, that's all the, the media, the social media and what they allow, and the world services, uh, that um, should be world, uh, is a space that makes us reach out. So today's media allow us to have consequences on real life, but we start first online, and then we go offline. And that's, I think, one of the big transformations of the social turn. And uh, there's convergence everywhere. Right? And we don't know what 
shape it will look, it will look like the smart TV, this cloud TV, the social TV. Um, it's still TV, it's still a long narrative form, there's still series, etc., etc. Uh, but it's already uh, social media, it's already uh, responding um, to um, these proposals, engaging uh, and empowering, mm, empowering people around these stories and engaging people to write or remix their own stories. And this is a, a very uh, dynamic uh, moment in which we are, very destabilizing, very disruptive. Disruptive is the word. Hello. Okay. Um, because um, uh, it makes us um, have to revisit everything uh, and uh, uh, revisit um, what's happening to media and information literacy. Um, by uh, the pre-digital media, uh, we um, had gotten to a relatively established, stabilized epistemology. Yeah? What are the, our words, what are uh, our concepts, what are our perimeters, yeah? which is what I'm trying to talk about here. And we've stabilized on the idea of empowerment and engagement, as I was telling you, with an axis um, that um, puts media and information literacy in the creativity part and the citizenship part out and inside schools uh, and on paradigms of research and social policy that have moved between protection um, and, and participation between the idea of risk and the idea of play. You follow me and you recognize these, uh, these paradigms that, that have been ours for a while and that I've seen that you've picked up also in your publication. Um, but um, the world has been impacted by several things in terms of uh, the users. Uh, and it's um, the, uh, the arrival. I'm trying to see where I am in my PowerPoint so that I can jump faster. Um, the arrival of several um, uh, huge world events. Um, and uh, social media are impacting us via globalization. One of the big world events, and it's part of the research I did for UNESCO, uh, is uh, the use of social media for terror. Uh, especially since 2012-14 with Syria and uh, uh, this idea uh, that um, young people are being radicalized online uh, by, um, by terrorists. And here I've given you some examples of our research and what, what kind of terms we found uh, online. There is no proof for the moment that uh, radicalization online happens directly. There's a, a lot of um, uh, uh, several um, uh, elements of proof, um, but what we know for sure is that the terrorists are using social media and are trying to indoctrinate young people. So here we find the media literacy uh, issue uh, about uh, how to uh, educate young people. And uh, uh, there is uh, definitely uh, this suspicion and the fact that uh, the social media are facilitating a lot of exchanges. These ones, and also the clothed ones, the less well-known ones. Um, but definitely they brought to the fore uh, issues that we had seen before uh, in the media and information literacy in the 80s and 90s about violence, hate speech, etc. comes back and it, of course, pits um, hate speech versus online freedoms. And it's one of the risks uh, to ensure that we uh, continue with online freedoms um, in spite of uh, um, this kind of um, risky content and, and risky behavior. And then there is disinformation, which, I, uh, which is called publicly fake news. And we, uh, uh, part of, the, uh, of our team at the uh, high level expert group uh, on, um, on disinformation, we've published a report very recently where we say fake news doesn't exist. Uh, it's about disinformation. And so it modifies my shuttle screen situation, uh, as I was mentioning to you, uh, because uh, we still have the engaging storytelling, but this time it's mostly parody, it's mostly uh, false uh, information or true information in a different context, and it's a lot of the use of opinions, remix, and reports. Um, and uh, what happens is that uh, there's two kinds of disinformation appearing. Uh, one that I call the soft disinformation because it's the one that is, doesn't have very important consequences. It's mostly about parody, it's mostly about clickbait, um, advertising, uh, it has a, an element of fun. We find again the play um, dimension, the participatory play dimension of, um, of our epistemology. And then there's the hard disinformation that goes towards plot theory, hybrid threats, uh, which is to say uh, countries <coughs> Uh, foreign countries uh, tampering with um, um, national policy, 
uh, election integrity, information integrity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, the current media panic that we are living uh, with uh, Facebook and, and uh, Google in particular, and the, the latest um, revelations about um, that kind of um, manipulation of, uh, of data. Um, so. Um, uh, we have a new kind uh, of fake news, it seems to me, that is here to say, uh, and that is um, um, the beginning of uh, the top, uh, the tip of an iceberg for what is going to be information disorder at large, and uh, that brings really media and information literacy together uh, for um, uh, an, a better understanding of the whole ecosystem in which there are things that are very positive, uh, uh, very participatory, very democratic, and with it uh, coming together uh, things that are uh, much more uh, negative and, and that are going to require um, education. So it changes also our epistemology. We are in sort of augmented epistemology with um, uh, with the, s the social turn, uh, the social media adding to the m uh, mainstream media, uh, and each time there's an addition. Uh, to protection, we need to now add data priv privacy. To participation, we have to make sure about online uh, freedoms. Um, to citizenship, we now have to make sure that there is a proper internet governance. Uh, because under the social media, the sustaining um, environment is fully the digital environment and all media are now online, even the, uh, the printed press. Uh, so there is discussions to, to have about who controls the media and who watches the watchdogs uh, kind of uh, logic, which is brought out in particular by the debate on fake news. And in terms of creativity, of course, it's uh, how to make sure that online freedoms uh, contribute to creativity any country that has censorship uh, doesn't experience some of the possibilities uh, of creativity. And I'm mentioning rogue countries um, that you all know of, um, uh, that are um, at the moment producing uh, terror, but also producing censorship. No creativity with censorship. So this is where I think we are in terms of the research, as epistemology, the shared vocabulary, the shared perimeters uh, in which we can say this is a new field, this is a real field, it is not a subsidiary field to others. And we have to really uh, build it and buttress it more and more by research and with a research agenda that is sustainable and uh, uh, that is strong with uh, important uh, researchers validated by uh, research support. <coughs> And so it's about um, enabling mail now that I want to talk to you about, um, including enabling it by research, uh, research on policy and uh, what is happening with mail policies worldwide, on the curricula and the training of teachers because if we, and researchers, because if we go towards building a field, we are going to need all the paraphernalia that build the field. We did uh, a SWOT analysis um, in uh, the compared project on Translate with a lot of European colleagues, some of whom are in this room. Uh, and uh, uh, we saw the strengths and weaknesses of a uh, mail now. Strengths, there is actually a lot of uh, resources and we have a definition and we have an epistemology, which can be a strong point. And in most European countries, hopefully in other continents, but that's a battle, still uh, in the going, uh, we have policy frameworks, national policy frameworks, European policy frameworks. We have moved um, towards a social turn, so we have multimodality and transitoracy uh, ap appearing, which bring together our different subsets, so media on one hand, information on the other hand. We have weaknesses, and again, I've put the same ones on purpose, and because the definition, uh, sometimes if it's too wide, uh, doesn't um, allow for focused approaches. Um, and the policy framework sometimes is not strong. Um, and so it looks like we have it all, but it's not being implemented. And so uh, these are two elements that uh, we still need to, to work on. Definitely the weakness uh, for media and information literacy is funding and evaluation. Funding because often media and information literacy is melted with other research, other disciplines, and there is no clear uh, positioning of uh, budgets around it. Um, evaluation, because often 
uh, media literacy is conducted via good practices, or sensible practices, as I, as I call them. And the last thing they do is evaluate, and often is self-evaluation, which by research standard is not valid. So this is some of our weaknesses. But it's, a good to, it's good to figure out your weaknesses, because this is where you can then put some action. The threats, the digital undertow, we see it now, eh, with risk coming back, and the protective uh, framework that we had more or less counterbalanced successfully with participation and creativity. It's back to the fore, with again wording we heard in the 50s and 60s about inoculation. Um, so careful, because we might regress in all the, our acquisitions uh, in the field. Trompe l'oeil effect, which is to say this feeling that there's a lot going on, a lot of resources, etc., etc., but it's weak because of funding and evaluation. And the disconnect effect, this idea that sometimes people keep still thinking pre-digital media, the press, as something separate from what is happening with social media, whereas in fact they are interconnecting more and more and converging. So it's all these kind of mindsets that are also risky in terms of uh, uh, decisions. But um, what we propose um, eventually is a kind of a policy framework where we um, try to put all the three sectors together. And the new thing about media literacy, of course, is that the civic sector uh, comes and mitigates um, the risk of media and information literacy being privatized, as it is now with announcement like Google and its news literacy fund. Google gives a lot of money. G Google gives a lot of money to fact checkers, etc., directly. What is the independence of a fact checker when the money gets from Google and Google is part of a problem? I asked you. And I have nothing against Google. It's just uh, the, the, the <laughs> a fact. Huh? So we have to learn to do better in terms of multi-stakeholderism. Uh, and of course, uh, it will imply quality control. One of the issues about fake news is the loss of quality news because of the advertisement uh, model of, uh, of the platforms at the moment. Um, so quality control is important. It's connected to evaluation. And uh, here you see the means, uh, resources and training, and the modalities, funding and evaluation. So to get a good policy framework in all countries, I suggest we go in this direction and we share the validity of all these different points. If one is removed, the pyramid falls. So we have to bring it all together in a um, concerted manner. And as a result, in our research, we were able to see that um, there were three types of models going on in Europe. And they're not harmonized. And that creates, uh, on the European territory, it creates um, the unbalance. Some countries that are more developed than others. Guess what? In terms of uh, um, delegating and developing models, uh, these are all the Nordic countries. They're moving forward, they've put media and information literacy or multiple literacies in the core curriculum. Other countries are still delegating and delegating a lot to so civil society, NGOs, etc., a little bit and more and more to the private sector. Mm -mm. And there's some countries, uh, including mine uh, and England, that are disengaging after having had very solid support um, of media and information literacy, and that are replacing often uh, media and information literacy by coding. And, and I always say, no coding without decoding. Eh? You need both uh, to have a balanced uh, uh, kind of approach uh, to, uh, to our issues. So modeling is important when you do research, um, which is why we're, we're pushing for that. And this model, of course, like all models, are criticable, must be criticized, must be added on to, etc. So how can we enable meal? At this point, where we are fairly advanced in Europe, and hopefully um, uh, we're going to push this in Latin America and Northern America, and then all the other countries, we uh, are getting to be more and more precise about meal competences and digital citizenship. And we have worked with the Council of Europe on developing digital citizenship education competences. I'll share that with you in a minute. Um, but the more I look, and this is, uh, these two elements are elements we put in the high-level group on fake news, mm. on our report, if you want to look at it. We push for a core curriculum. Uh, it is no longer about just reading and writing and counting. Today, if you don't publish, navigate and participate, you're out. You're no longer part of the citizenship debate, the participation debate. So. Um, this has to be said again and again to all the ministries of education. Uh, the basics today, 
they are about publishing and participating and navigating. And guess what? And as you know that all of you who are practitioners, you can make children write and read a lot by making them publish. Okay, so it's not against the free first basics and the free arts, it's together with, but it really has to come into the core curriculum. And so how to do it? Because we are all fed up, all of us, all of you, who are fighting to get in the curriculum, think they've gotten it, have policy programs, and it's not happening, and it's not happening at national level, creating a lot of unfairness. The only way we found uh, in the discussions is to say, okay, let's have formal evaluation, PISA. And God knows in France we don't like PISA. But, but uh, if you want to have it counted, if you want uh, the countries to start separating the funding, evaluating the funding separately, the competences separately, then some standard tools have to be used and some indicators. So reluctantly, I think we have to push for this. Of course, a lot of teacher training, and the good news is that we now have online training, especially MOOCs, and we should be careful with our collaboration with other stakeholders. There are stakeholders, the, the social media platforms are worried about uh, the situation. They know that they're losing trust, they're losing markets, they're losing points, as you know about. Uh, Facebook fell 7% uh, in, uh, in the stock exchange uh, just at the announcement of the Cambridge Analytica. So uh, there is a mobilization that is interesting for us, and I see fake news as good news, if I may say so, for us, because it's a Crash Course 101 about what media literacy is about and why it's important. But major caveat, careful, funding has to remain independent because it's also fundamental for uh, independent research. And that takes place in universities. It doesn't take place um, in um, Google AI intelligence centers. So. Um, that's for one, but if we now want to say, hang on, what are the competences? What are we going to ask PISA to evaluate? This is what we get from our research uh, in Translate. Huh? The fact that there, are, there is free information cultures coming together now and touching each other. The media one, the documentation one, huh? the libraries are very big help for us huh? in, um, in media literacy, and the data one. Huh? So it's by putting these three literacies together and the competences that go with it. That we can do it inside the schools and outside the schools and give children agencies. And the funny thing is that when we compare the different uh, re uh, reference matrices, um, matrices that were uh, sets of competences uh, that were taking place, for instance, in France, and we have one, two, three, four, including the DigiComp, European DigiComp, in fact, we find always, more or less, the same five major domains. And it's information, documentation, it's creation, it's citizenship and safety, together and rights, uh, it's um, uh, the environment, uh, the understanding of the economics in particular, and it's uh, collaboration and participation. So these five dimensions are what is needed for 21st century skills, it seems to me and that we should keep working on. We've been able to um, put them also uh, in the Council of Europe uh, in the digital citizenship competences, uh, saying careful because the word competence is not very well understood, especially not by business, who thinks that competences is just about uh, skills. Uh, that's why we need to be several stakeholders. Uh, the, the business only understands that. Uh, we are about values, uh, and uh, in school these days, God knows they needed with terror and hate speech. It's about attitudes, how you interact with real life, and it's about building a real body of knowledge so that you can create a critical understanding and critical uh, minds. And that's what we try to do uh, in MOOCs. Uh, we had MOOCs, a European project uh, for MOOCs for teacher training, uh, in which, for instance, uh, we did a MOOC on media and information literacy. Uh, and we were able to prove that there was a lot of satisfaction uh, and a lot of projects that could come out of MOOCs. So online training is an option, it's not perfect. But definitely in the MOOCs, we were able to explore several critical 
uh, postures. And because critical minds uh, need to be created over time, it's not imp something you can improvise. And so it's about training young people, but also adults, um, to rotate in their roles, um, uh, change perspectives regularly about their understanding of media, explorer when you don't want to go too, too much in depth, analysis when you want to be a little bit challenged, creating when you want to be uh, more into the publishing and participating mood. And you're allowed all three, and all across our lives, we can be in these different roles, as, as, you, as you know. So this is it for the moment. And if you want to read more, this is our book uh, on the, the public uh, policies in Europe. Uh, this is the book on digital citizenship education that will have a second volume and a handbook coming up soon. This is uh, the report of um, the expert group, and this is the report uh, of um, research about youth and violent extremism. Thank you for your attention. Wow. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Fantastic stuff. Um, Davina's opened up so many fronts there, critical fronts, many ways that we can uh, come in on, on what she said. I hope you're, uh, you're up for it. Um, with no further ado, let's move on then to David, um, David Buckingham. And once again, I'll, uh, I'll go back to my little uh, chuleta, my little uh, help, helping text here. David Buckingham is a scholar, writer, and consultant specializing in young people, media, and education. He is Emirate professor, Emeritus Professor sorry, at Loughborough University and Visiting Professor at Sussex University and at King's College London. He was for many years a professor of education at the Institute of Education, London University, where he was the founder and director of the Center for the Study of Children, Youth, and Media. He is an interna internationally recognized expert on children's and young people's interactions with electronic media and on media literacy education. He has directed more than 25 externally funded research projects on these issues, it's huge, and has been a consultant for bodies such as the Uni uh, United Nations, UNESCO, UNICEF, the European Commission, and the UK government. Um, I'd like to see you do that in the Brexit <laughs> landscape. <laughs> so it's a good job that uh, you're in the twilight in that sense, uh, David, I think. Um, he's continuing to undertake research, consultancy, and evaluation, and has recently worked for organizations such as the Media Education Association Space Studio, and family, kids, and youth. Numerous publications, 220 articles. His books have been translated into, yeah, I heard some gasps there from the, the young researchers section. His work has been tra translated, there is hope. His work has been translated into uh, 15 languages, um, and his, his, his most recognized texts are all available in the, uh, in the literature that comes with the conference. He's been a visiting professor at universities in the US, in Norway, Australia, Italy, Hong Kong, and South Africa, and has addressed conferences in more than 35 countries around the world. And one final thing, he is a nominated fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and an elected fellow of the British Academy. Um, my job, as the same as with Davino, is to try and control the time dimensions, um, but David will do the best that he can. So. Um, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Good luck with uh, controlling the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a lost cause. Okay, okay. So, uh, yes, yeah, so if you were here this morning, I won't be rapping. Um, <laughs> although, having this, it, it feels a bit like sort of Barcelona's got talent or something. <laughs> um, okay, we were asked to talk to, to this um, theme here new challenges to media literacy, fake news, post truth, and data privacy, which is pretty much everything, really. Um, my feeling is that we are at a moment of change. Davina talked about the social turn. I think there's another turn going on. Um, and I think one of the things I look to at this point is history. Um, here we have the, the front cover of Wired magazine from 1995, the first ever Wired magazine published in the UK. Um, and I think what you have here is the, the kind of typical rhetoric of the time. There's been, there's been very little um, history 
of digital media. One, one book that I really recommend is this book called uh, From Counterculture to Cyberculture by uh, an American called Fred Turner. And what Fred Turner does is to show how the history of the internet, of cyberculture, was really tied up with the hippie counterculture. And he focuses in particular on a man called Stuart Brand and the Whole Earth Catalogue. And some of us here may be old enough to remember that. Um, and he also talks about how, as the counterculture evolved, hippies increasingly merged with new forms of entrepreneurial capitalism. So think about Steve Jobs. Think about Google with their don't be evil slogan. And I think his, his uh, subtitle of his book talks about um, cyber utopianism. Um, the idea that somehow technology will bring about social change, will revitalize democracy, will, will set us all free. Um, it, in a way, it's a kind of, or it was a kind of optimistic variety of technological determinism, that technology would come along and, and transform society, in this case, transform society for the better. Now, you can see that rhetoric um, around in the early years of the internet, of, of digital technology, um, also resurfacing around that social turn, the advent of Web 2.0, or what we might now call social media. Um, the idea that somehow barriers to entry in the media industries were disappearing, that everybody was now a producer. Media power was a thing of the past, that in a way the people were taking control, that popular democracy, um, self-expression would flourish in this new media age. Now, I think a lot of people bought that argument. Um, I think it's an argument that has undeniable appeal. There's almost a kind of wishful thinking about it, really. Um, but many of us, myself included, I would say, have been questioning that story for a long time. I can look back to some of the things I wrote even in the 1990s, uh, certainly in the mid-2000s, and really being quite sceptical about some of these massive optimistic, utopian claims that people were making about the democratic potential of technology, about ideas of, of creativity, participation, community, collaboration, and so on. I actually remember feeling rather sort of old-fashioned and, and a bit grumpy um, at the time. I guess now I've reached a certain age, I have the right to be grumpy. Um, but actually, I think I didn't know the half of what was going to happen. This was this week's news story. This is taken from the Guardian website, the story of Cambridge Analytica, this UK-based company that harvested the data of 50 million Facebook users and sold it to the Trump campaign. It's a story that has actually been growing for some time, particularly um, with a journalist at the Guardian, but the evidence is now becoming clearer. And as Davina mentioned, um, entertainingly, um, Facebook lost 70% of its share value. 7%, rather. <laughs> 7. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just more wishful thinking. Um, <laughs> uh, but interestingly, 7% was $25 billion. So that is 7% of what Facebook is worth. Um, as also did Alphabet um, and Apple lose um, their, their um, share price as well. And it suggests, I think, that the shareholders are starting to get threatened by the prospect of regulation around the corner. Now, in a way, if the government or if governments outlaw data harvesting, then in a way, this is a major problem for social media companies because it undermines the basic business model of social media. I, I would say, in retrospect, 2017 was the year, um, I was going to say this in English, the worm turned. We have this expression, I thought, the Spanish people won't understand the worm turned. I put it into Google, and I came up with this expression, el perro enseña los dientes, yeah? So the dog at last shows its teeth, um, which I think is actually much better than the worm turned. <laughs> um, I, I think perhaps in retrospect, 2017, last year, will be the year 
when finally most people realised that social media were not just a benign force for good, that perhaps the public debate reached a, a tipping point, to use another dubious metaphor. Um, there's been a shift, I think, in the public debate. There's always been concerns about the dark side of social media, um, but in many ways this debate is now broadening out and it, it's changing. So, yes, we're used to the debate about porn and paedophiles, but actually the debate is increasingly becoming one about democracy um, and about individual mental health. Actually, the debate about social media is becoming a debate about what kind of society we want, what kind of people we want to be or we want our children to be, how we want to live. So over the past year, yes, we've had fake news, and I will come back to that, the whole post-truth argument. We've had arguments about radicalization, information war. Um, increasingly, though, debates about privacy, um, data mining, data gathering. Um, we've had concerns about abuse and cyberbullying and hate speech online. And perhaps just to add to that list, the concern about addiction and mental health. I mean, I, I could go on, and in many ways, I think you know all of this. Now, I have some concerns about the validity of some of those, um, those issues. Um, I think there is a danger, as always, of a kind of moral panic, a kind of hysteria. And in re really, there is an internet safety industry that is concerned to stoke that kind of alarmism, that sort of exaggeration, that moral panic. There are moral entrepreneurs of various kinds um, mounting campaigns to draw attention to themselves, often for quite other reasons. And they're using this issue um, as a way of making much broader campaigns. I think there is also a question about the validity of the evidence um, about these phenomena, about their likely effects. I mean, I could certainly talk about the evidence or lack of evidence, as I see it, around this idea of addiction and concerns about mental health. But actually, fake news is, is a, another very good example. I mean, where is the evidence around fake news? How useful is the definition that we're being offered? Um, you know, what do we know really about the prevalence of fake news. And in particular, I think the, the key question here is about the influence of fake news. How does so-called fake news feed into people's political beliefs, their behavior? Why people believe the things that they do? Why is it that people believe things that they may know on some level to be untrue? Um, I think there's a very complex issue here around belief, which a lot of the research really hasn't begun to engage with. So I think we need to be careful here of, of rushing down this road of, of moral panic or cyber hysteria. I think we need to take care um, and look at the evidence. And I don't see too much evidence on many of these issues just yet. However, I think the other problem, and in some ways the, the bigger point I want to make, is that you know, there's a broader issue going on. We have a set of problems now. Um, in, in being raised in the debate about social media. But it's often seen in very atomized terms. These are often seen as a set of rather distinct separate issues. And what we then have is fragmentary solutions. So fake news, yes, let's employ some fact checkers. Addiction, well, let's produce an app that stops children from going on social media and, and so on and so on. Lots of, of quick-fix solutions that I think are unlikely to have very much long-term impact. Um, fake news, again, is a good example. You know, you've had the social media companies putting ads in the newspaper to warn people about fake news. You've had games produced um, to inoculate people against fake news. Uh, you've had fact-checkers being employed to put ticks or little green lights on websites. I mean, all of these are the things that social media companies have been doing, and I think they're all really basically responding to political concern. They don't want to be regulated. They're looking for cheap and easy answers to the problem. Um, I'm actually getting really bored <laughs> with all the talk about fake news, partly, I think, um, because it's such an easy charge. You know, if Donald Trump 
can accuse the people he disagrees with of fake news, then actually fake news has become an almost meaningless term. It's just a, a synonym for things I don't agree with. Um, and my point here, again, is that, is that fake news and many of these issues are symptoms of much bigger problems and issues. And I worry, in a way, that focusing our attention on these issues one at a time is a way of distracting attention from the bigger picture. So what is the bigger picture? Well, there it is. I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't already know. But I think there's going to be a lot of talk at this conference about digital creativity, participation, empowerment, self-expression, and so on. And I think it's just important to remind ourselves that the companies that are making this possible, the contemporary media and technology landscape, is really dominated by a very small number of what are fast-approaching monopolies. And if you look at the statistics for all of this, it's very clear. Facebook claims 2.2 billion active users, about 30% of the whole world population. Um, no other social network comes anywhere near close that. Um, and Facebook owns most of the ones that do, like Instagram and, and Messenger. Um, more than 90% of internet searches, uh, 3.5 billion internet searches every day, are via Google. Other platforms are utterly trivial by comparison. Google is far and away the world's biggest media company, more than twice as much revenue as its nearest competitor, which is actually Disney. Um, and of course, Google owns, or Google's parent company, Alphabet, owns YouTube, which is far and away the biggest um, in terms of video and music distribution. Around 80% of the market share of multimedia um, it has uh, over 80% of the market share of multimedia sites. About 5 billion videos are watched every day on, on YouTube. Meanwhile, we have Amazon that dominates, increasingly dominates online retail. Uh, about half the market in online retail in the US is via Amazon. Um, and online shopping is increasingly, as we know, replacing bricks and mortar. Um, but Amazon is also as we know, um, a, now a producer and distributor of a whole range of media content. Apple, okay, a hardware company with a massively successful set of devices that both Davina and I have advertised for your benefit. Um, uh, there are over 700 million iPhone users in the world, and that number is rising. Um, but Apple also increasingly dominates the market in music distribution, uh, in paid form movie content. Now, these are all companies with different histories, with different profiles, different strategies, but they are among the most profitable companies of any kind in the world. They are working hard to keep it that way, and they are dominating our current media landscape. Now, we know all of this, and in a way, this next thing is, is a kind of note to self, <laughs> at least. You know, we need to take care about this. Um, I'm certainly wary of my own tendency to a kind of knee-jerk anti-capitalism. Um, you know, the sense that far from Google not being evil, that it actually is profoundly, deeply evil, that Mark Zuckerberg is a kind of devil in jeans and a, a T-shirt. And in fact, if you go online, you can see some fantastic um, conspiracy videos about Mark Zuckerberg and the Illuminati. Um, I'll, I'll leave that to you to explore. The point, my point is that it's, it's much more complex than this. I mean, as I've said, it's these platforms that provide the resources, uh, not just the means of distribution, but also the templates, the structures within which a lot of the communication and self-expression we're talking about takes place. Um, both the good and the bad. Of course, they are... Um, commercially funded, um, and in many ways, I think they, they end up owning not just our data, but the products of our digital labor. Um, but the basic business model is actually rather different from that of older media. It's no longer about companies selling content. It's actually about companies gathering and selling data. 
the terms of the relationship, the terms of the contract between the producer or the provider and the user um, are very different from the terms of the contract with older media. Um, and in many ways, they're much less obvious and much less visible than they used to be. Even so, I don't think that an old-style propaganda model works here. I don't think it's simply the case that economic control means ideological control. We need a sophisticated, subtle political economy of media. How capitalism works is more complicated than many of its critics tend to assume. I think the key question, the, the challenge in a way, is how we regulate these media. How do we ensure that the public interest, the public good, seems like a very old-fashioned term to be using, is sustained and protected at a point where actually more or less our entire media and communication landscape is controlled by a small number of global commercial enterprises. Part of that discussion needs to be about content. Um, and fake news is, is an example of that. I think irrespective of who produces the content, there are issues about how we work towards reliable, high-quality, diverse media content. Companies like Facebook and Google like to present themselves as just technology companies. Um, they want to disclaim any responsibility for content. They want to present themselves as providers of neutral services, not even as publishers. Um, not least because if they did admit that they were publishers, if, if they did admit that they were media companies, that would actually cost them vast amounts of money because it would mean that they would have to take responsibility for content. And if you look at the dance that Facebook has done around fake news, you can very much see that. They want to preserve their business model. So content is certainly an issue, but I think there are other issues. Privacy, we talked about. Questions about surveillance and privacy, very much dramatized with the Cambridge Analytica story. Questions about access. How do we ensure that people continue to have equal access? The whole issue of net neutrality here. Questions about who's doing the work, who owns what is produced. Questions about copyright and digital labor. Um, and questions at the end of the, uh, end of the day about where the damn money goes. You know, when are these people going to pay their bloody taxes? Yes? So I think all of these are questions that have to be addressed at a level of, of regulation. Regulation is not easy. And one of the issues that will inevitably arise is to do with free speech. It's the first cry that comes in response. Um, but I think there are questions we, we might want to debate about you know, how much freedom do we want to need? Should there be constraints on freedom? Do we actually have freedom of speech at the moment? Um, these problems are, I think, very difficult to solve. Regulation is going to be very difficult to achieve, partly for technological reasons, but partly also, I would say, for political reasons. So very often, companies will claim, and the government will claim, that regulation is technologically not going to be possible. In a way, the technology has evaded any attempt to control it. But also, there's a sense in which, for many governments, I, I'm not so sure that they actually want it, that their political ideology will allow regulation of the so-called free market. And what we're seeing not just at the level of the companies, but also at the level of governments, is very piecemeal responses. A fair amount of talk about how we don't like fake news, how we don't like online radicalization, but really very little substantial in terms of concrete action. Now, it's often at this point, <laughs> with about five minutes left in my talk, that <laughs> education comes on to the agenda, um, and certainly for government. You know, governments are reluctant to regulate, but let's look to education. Let's look to media literacy as the answer. We can't solve the problem, so let's get the teachers to do it. A very common kind of solutionism that emerges when people talk about education. Now, for those of us who've been arguing for this for a long time, there's a danger of, of kind of, uh, you know... Assuming that somehow our time has come, you know, at last the thing that we've been calling for is going to happen. 
Um, and I've read lots of strange articles in, in British um, newspapers recently of people saying, saying things like, well, you know, we have this problem of fake news. You know, what we really need is in education about the internet. And this sends me into a fury because I'm, I'm thinking, well, you know, we've been doing that. <laughs> we've been doing it. It's called media education. We've been arguing for this for years and years, for decades. So there's a bit of a sense that, you know, here is a great opportunity arising um, with these issues emerging on the agenda. Um, but nevertheless, I think we need to be careful of some of the dangers. We have a history of this in, in the UK, and I have to say it's not a good history. Um, in the, uh, the early 2000s, the government uh, merged the regulatory media and telecoms regulatory system and created a new body called Ofcom. Uh, this is Ofcom's headquarters um, on uh, the Thames in London that are appropriately obese. Um, <laughs> But Ofcom's approach to regulation was influential or has been influential around the world. And it was an approach that was very much about media literacy as an alternative to regulation. As the government backed off regulating the so-called free market, what it wanted to do was to empower consumers, to make people themselves responsible for their own regulation arming media consumers, enabling media consumers to regulate themselves. This was the argument. Now, since about 2010, I would say that has more or less disappeared from the policy agenda. By, by 2010, media literacy was finished as a policy theme. And there's a big story about why this happened. Um, but I would say a big part of it was because media literacy came out of policy on media and communications. It didn't come out of education policy. And it found it very hard to, to make the links with education policy. Um, for various reasons, the Ministry of Education and actually ministries of education around the world have been very reluctant to embrace media literacy, even if the communications policy makers are pushing for it. I think there is a problem with this version of media literacy that it's a very individualistic response. It, it, it places the responsibility for safety, for privacy, for dealing with phenomena like fake news and hate speech back onto the individual. Um, and I think there is a bit of a, a, a risk in a way that in pushing responsibility back to the individual, we end up making government regulation unnecessary. So there's a danger that accountability, um, you know, in a way media literacy becomes a kind of alibi for the reluctance to regulate, for the failures and exclusions of digital capitalism. The market just has to be allowed to do its business and the problem is one for you, the individual consumer, to solve. So. I think this is almost my last slide you'll be pleased to hear. Actually, it's not, but anyway. Okay, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. Wh uh, why do we need media literacy education? Um, I think it's, it's important to say that, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about media literacy, much less talk about media literacy in education. Um, I think we need systematic, sustained forms of media literacy education for children from a very young age, and we need them to happen in institutions in which ju those children spend large amounts of time, i.e. schools. Um, so if this makes me old-fashioned, then I'm sorry again. I think we're going to see a, a lot of uh, discussion in the conference about informal learning, about the kinds of learning that can happen online in various forms of of online spaces, social media platforms, among gaming communities, um, in media fandoms. I think that's all fine. But I would say that I don't think media literacy is something that is going to develop spontaneously of its own accord. I don't think the people who are the biggest users of media um, are necessarily the people who are the most media literate. Discuss. You know, the biggest fans, the most prolific tweeters, the most ardent gamers, I'm not necessarily sure that those people are necessarily the most media literate. 
In my view, media literacy requires a systematic process of study. Um, it's about developing a critical approach, um, and that's something which I think is best developed in schools. So you can call it transmedia literacies. I think media literacy was always transmedia literacy anyway, so I'm less concerned about, about the terminology. Um, but I think this is something that we need taught systematically in schools. It needs to be a necessary entitlement for children from a very young age, but not something that will substitute for media reform. So I think, as I say, there's a danger that education becomes the alternative to regulation, the more palatable alternative for government. I actually think media literacy education and media reform need to go together. Um, there's a bit of a danger that, in a way, if we push everything onto media literacy, we, we're passing the buck. We're avoiding responsibility um, for what is happening in this new media environment. Okay, I was rushing a bit at the end, I'm sorry. Um, I, have, I blog about these things these days, so um, if you want some more of me, then uh, go to my, uh, my website. I've been doing some things very recently, actually, that are very practical about, okay, how do we teach about social media? Um, I think I'm putting up another one up next week, so please go and have a look. Thanks very much. I think if we were to attach, you attach. use Davina and David's slides, we'd have enough classes now for the next three or four months, especially because all the vocabulary is, is hyper-condensed as well um, due to the PowerPoint format. So it's just a permanent explosion of um, <laughs> ideas and um, keywords that each one is like a little package that opens up mm -hmm. so many sub-ideas. Um, I was thinking of some ironic uh, issues as, as you were both speaking, um, certainly related to skepticism about Google literacy, for example. And it just came to my mind, uh, I don't know if you followed this story, um, the, uh, the Oscar-nominated movie, uh, The Post, which is supposed to be a kind of cry out to a pre-Trump era where journalists um, published the truth and facts were checked, um, has been fact-checked itself and has proven to be full of inaccuracies. Um, and they're just endless, endless ironies um, in that sense, um, which also reminded me, thinking about David's um, comments on the companies, you may be aware that there is a strike on at Amazon in Madrid, and uh, my youngest child said to me last night that he didn't know that Amazon had any people. <laughs> he is very little. How, how, <laughs> could, how, how could a person, how could a, a machine go on strike? Um, and to see, tele, to see TV pictures of a picket line yeah, yeah. of people drinking coffee in the cold as they picketed the line to the entrance to the Amazon factory in Madrid, in San Fernando de Henares, I think, was uh, was really kind of interesting moment of uh, you know technological interface as we were watching the news. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but I really don't want to um, abuse the position of being up here um, very long. So if you've got some questions, please um, get them to us. Um, one that did came up, and you were just hinting at it at the end, David. But my question came from Davina's presentation. Was um, so what are we to do in this? How can we sort of educate or engage young people in this um, swamp, which is this fake news world? I mean, it seems to me that we've got two possibilities, but I'm sure there are more. One is that we return to some kind of strengthening of core values about you know, debates about what is the truth and what are facts. And you mentioned the public good, David. Or well, the other one is maybe a more conservative proposal, which is like a self-defense mechanism, which is, should we be um, engaging young people and how to navigate in this um, uncertain world full of uh, cyber hysteria, um, 
uncertainties and so on. So I'm not really sure whether should we, we should be sort of um, playing it safe and, and, and teaching young people how to navigate in this complicated world, if teachers are equipped to do that, be another issue, or um, whether we should make a sort of a larger platform and a bigger discourse, which is pulling people back to sort of like basic core values. David referred to it as being old-fashioned, but I'm not really sure. Um, I don't know what your opinion is on this. Should we play it safe and, and help them through these troubled times or adopt a more a larger approach which goes back to sort of broader values about what is truth and fact and correct procedures which may not necessarily engage younger people as well but is, is not a harmless uh, cry for help. Mm. Do you want to go first? Or shall I? I mean. <laughs> okay, I'll go first. Um, uh, both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm personally fighting for the creation of a public service online, uh, the, the recognition that um, um, we have to have several alternatives to what is going on and to this um, monopoly of uh, the GAFA by creating our own um, full line of. Um, public social media, um, uh, everything together, you know, a, a public search engine, a public, uh, so public social media, uh, public um, apps, etc., public algorithms, mm. and it's all possible. But at the moment, of course, the GAFA don't want to hear anything about public because uh, it means public service obligations. Mm. And they are in this quandary where they are totally proprietary, commercial uh, universe, that has become our de facto public space. No plot theory here, they didn't want that, it's just happening. And though they say they're not media, the users, the young people say, you're media, YouTube. Uh, so, you know, uh, this is the first step. So we have to talk with them, and we, uh, it's been very interesting, this high-level group meeting, because uh, they are now recognizing that they're media. But, and understandably so, they're not like the old media. And so if we go towards a regulatory model, it has to be a regulatory model that um, is different from uh, the old media. They, they actually have a regulatory model, which is the information provider model, not a publisher, uh, etc. I'm claiming that they should move towards a public trustee model, which is the television model uh, in the United States, and a kind of hybrid. So we are talking regulation with them. And they have to be part of this conversation. They're not the enemy. We use them. Who in this room would go without them? We can't ask that of our children if we can't do it ourselves. So we have to go and speak to them and say, several things are happening. You are our de facto public good, okay? How um, can it be? But also, we Europeans have been blind and naive. And we have to recognize that. We have allowed ourselves to be colonized by the GAFA, whereas other countries were resisting. Okay, we don't want to be those countries. They're called Saudi Arabia, uh, they're called China, uh. Uh, etc. But they show us that there are two possibilities, eh? censorship or we do duplicate everything and we have our whole line which is Chinese eh? from the search engine to the public uh, uh, social media etc. etc. And now they're invading us because of course while Facebook falls Tencent goes up. Mm -hmm. And we don't have an answer, a European answer, when we are the richest market and they all want us and our data because we are the only continent that makes money as a digital single market. <coughs> okay, Latin America a little bit because you're here, I'm saying that. <laughs> Africa, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> okay, so why are we sitting like ducks? What is happening? with our, our policy makers? My answer is, they are the ones who need to be media literate. And guess what? At the moment, this is what's happening. They are all asking for media literacy courses, crash course 101, governance, 
uh, internet governance because they are realizing that they're making the wrong public and private decisions because they don't understand the world in which they are. It's not the young people who don't understand. It's our decision makers. It's the bracket between 40 and 70 years old, 75 years old, who are in politics and who are in senior positions and making decisions of the past without any imagination, any projection on what our future and the future of our young people is. And I say we can stand in our boots. We are the continent of the public service media. They're not perfect. We've improved on them. They asked them to be diverse. We have asked them to be pluralistic. We have we've asked them to have uh, integrity during elections. All of this we've asked. These are values of ours. And this is the values we have now to ask the social media to put in place. If they don't do it, and they are moving. They're now, Facebook and Google are now talking about right to reply. We've put in place right to be forgotten. There's no fatality. As long as we know, as long as we're educated, we can put pressure on our politicians, but we have to educate our politicians. And the beauty of what I'm saying is that now we can also say we can have a public service internet. There are public interest algorithms. Interesting. There are um, search engines that don't trace you. There are social media that don't post ads. This is what we want. We don't want to be tracked, and we don't want to be polluted constantly by ads. And I'm not saying this should be the dominating mode of media being, but it's the viable alternative in which we can recognize ourselves, and we, in which we can say, here we are paying for high quality information, because there is a cost to the production of high quality information, and we've trained all of us and our children to think that high quality information is for free. And this is a big mistake. So my answer is, let's recognize our big mistakes and let's act on this. Let's be tolerant to ourselves. Let's be good to ourselves, but proactive. And that requires research and our type of research, good media and information literacy <coughs> research, not about moral panics, mm, but about um, the different situations in, in which we are. And so it's true, at the moment, there is zero proof that um, young people get radicalized online. And there is zero proof that people change attitude because they're stuck in bubble filters of fake news. And as usual, with harm, harmful content and harmful behavior, you can never find the proof of a direct connection. Because of course, it's a complex world. But we know the indirect consequences with violence, there's very little research proving that research violence makes you duplicate violent acts, but it creates fear in the population and it leads to policy making that is about security and policing. And here, the same thing is going to happen if we don't pay attention. Fake news is not about people changing their attitude in vote. It's about people distrusting completely their media, their institutions, their NGOs, their social services, their public services. We're making the bed for the colonization of a GAFA. And it will be our fault. It is not their fault. They're following their logic. They are very transparent about it. We are not coherent with ourselves and with our values and attitudes. And our reaction in Europe and in Latin America, I think, is going to be very important, and I'm pleading really for these two big continents to come together on this, because they have the biggest markets, they can influence the rest, Africa is watching, etc. is to come together on this and to stand on our boots about what we want the world to be for democracy. David? Okay, I'll... Uh <laughs> I might res respond to what Davina said, and then I'll no. back, back around to your <laughs> question. <laughs> well, I mean, yes, I, I mean, public social media, I, I agree, but I can remember, I always go back to Tim Berners-Lee, you know, the man who Weaving the allegedly Brit. invented the internet. Yeah. <laughs> um, and for Tim Berners-Lee, it was absolutely about public social media. It was absolutely oh, about He is furious media. right now. And I can remember even in the 90s, people saying, 
you know, just think what will happen if we just let this be driven by commercial interests. It's not going to turn out well. And 20 years on, we, we are in that place. I, I suppose my concern would be that, you know, the, the stable door is open and, and the horse is bolted. <laughs> yes? Um, and I'm particularly, I think, the issue is not only that you have these dominant commercial companies running things, but you also, they are also global companies. So I think there is a question about how far and how much Europe even, can I talk about this anymore? I'll, I'll continue to talk about Europe despite everything. Um, you know, how far Europe can actually kind of create a wall around itself, you know? And I think it's extremely, it's extremely difficult. I mean, yes. Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of, of the will. I mean, I, I, I think we, we need to m continue making that argument, but I think it's, it's a difficult one. Ca I'd like to kind of come back round to your question about, about what do we do in educational terms or what do we do for, for young people. Um, I mean, I, you know, fake news is not new. Um, or the question of disinformation, or the issue of what's true and what's not true, you know, what's objective, what's biased, etc. These are very old questions for those of us in in media studies, media education. I would say, as a media educator, that's something I've been teaching about for years and years and years, and I could I could point you to examples from a very long time ago of people addressing those issues. I think they are complex issues. I don't think there is... I mean, yes, there are lies and there, are, there is truth. But actually, between the lies and the truth, there's actually a lot of half-truths and things that are true in some ways and not true in others and so on. So, and I'm not being kind of stupidly postmodernist about this. I think actually this is a difficult question. Um, and I don't think simply going in and saying to kids, look... You know, you need to tell fact from fiction. You need to tell the true from the fake, and this is how you do it. That that will actually solve the problem. I think pedagogically, educationally, in the classroom, in the debates you have in the classroom, that is actually a really complex and difficult task to achieve. Um, I think my answer to your question was, you know, your question was, do we need sort of old-fashioned critical thinking, or do we need to, to, to be teaching kids how to navigate? I think, yes, like Davina, I would say we need both. It's not an either-or, it's a both-and. Um, I think we do need to think quite hard about what we mean by critical thinking in this context. It's one of these slogans that we often use. We want, we want kids to be critical. But actually, how do, we, how do we know when kids are being critical, I think, is a real, is a real challenge. Um, I think perhaps the big issue that connects all of these things is the issue of trust, um, because in a sense, what goes on in talking about public, public service media, you know, one reason why we want public service media is because we want people we can trust. We want editors, we want intermediaries, we want broadcasters, we want people to present this information to us, and we want to trust that they have done their job properly. Um, and one of the dangers of the, the fake news scenario is that we quite ri quickly reach a point where nobody trusts anybody. Mm -hmm. yes? yes? And, you know, there's a lot of discussion in the UK at the moment about how our respected public service media institution, the BBC, is no longer to be trusted. Yes? So I think we need to, we need to take care. There is a problem with trusting too much but there is a problem with not trusting enough. And the, how we actually, as educators, find a way, a way through that is very difficult. We want to teach kids to be sceptical. We want to teach them to be crit critical. But we don't want to teach them to be cynical and not to trust anything because that is dysfunctional. That gets us to a point where actually you know, nobody trusts anybody and, and we're in a... a, a, in a a situation of complete chaos. So actually how we, we put those things together, how we walk the line between too much trust and not enough trust, 
is a, is a really difficult one. Okay. Uh, staying true to my promise not to hog the floor, because I've got more questions here. Um, can, we, can we take a look at some questions that members of the public want to ask? Okay. Right, here we go. <laughs> this is fun, isn't it? Can I pick? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> no, 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 no. no, seriously. <laughs> it's a trick. It's a trick. There you go. <laughs> oh, it's a fake question. <laughs> <laughs> this one uh, is for David. But there, you can be both. <laughs> Please feel free. Are we reproducing previous media? moral panics, i.e. comics in the 1950s or television in the 1960s and 70s? Um, to some extent, yes, and to some extent, no. And I, I think there is always a danger with that moral panic argument that we quite quickly get to a position where what we're saying is, well, we've seen it all before. It was just the same in, in the 1950s. And in fact, I could tell you a a longer history of, you know, it was just the same in the 1930s with the cinema. It was just the same in the, in the 19th century with popular literature and, and popular theatre, music hall. Um, I think the danger with that is that we, we become ahistorical, yes? So actually there are significant shifts that go on in the media environment. We haven't actually seen it all before. There are, there are fairly obvious um, shifts that, that have gone on, particularly, in a way, in terms of the, the focus of the conference. People's ability to participate um, in this environment is different from what it was with, with older media. So, in some ways, we need to be uh, beware of moral panic. I think we understand quite a lot as media analysts about how moral panic works. I think I use that expression, moral entrepreneurs, um, which is one of my favorites. You know, we need to look at who is saying these things about the bad effects of digital media. Why are they saying them? How good is their evidence? What other interests do they seem to have? We need to have <coughs> our bullshit detectors turned on when we listen to these debates. But at the same time, I think we need, to, we need to beware of assuming that we've seen it all before and really there's no problem at all. So I'm afraid my answer is a, is a yes and no, but let's be careful answer. Okay. Yeah, I've written about uh, moral panics. I, ac I actually call them media panics because it's often a panic about a, a new media propagated by old media. And you can see how the media 101 uh, 1.0 have an interest in pointing what's happening with 2.0. They're saying they're taking our advertising money, they're producing the loss of quality in our productions, they are creating distrust, etc. And so it's true. But what I'm saying in my theory is that uh, we need um, media panics. It's the only way for people to put pressure on politicians. Before that, people remain rather like you and me on an everyday basis, sort of median consuming no action. Uh, every media panic has led to a change of the status quo in the media uh, ba background. In particular, there's been more self-regulation and more regulation. And this is what we're seeing, and we are seeing it at the, at the high level group. We are now putting a two-step approach. Those of you who haven't read the thing, I'm giving it to you in a nutshell. Huh? Two-step, for a year, the platforms have to come with self-regulation. They have to create uh, the means of self-governance and good practices there. We evaluate. If it doesn't work, we go to regulation. And this is what this uh, media panic has produced. We couldn't bring them around to the table before. Nobody could um, make them recognize we're media. The panic achieves that. Mm. And so it's about a, pub a debate, a public debate that couldn't happen. And that is happening because, at last, people are touched in their what? One of the media panics is always about fear of manipulation of the brain. And this is the one. The ones about violence or cyberbullying, etc., they're about other fears, fears of manipulation of reproduction, uh, rape, etc., um, fears uh, around who decides about death. 
mm. and who gives death. Mm. The, the ones that are about advertising, they're about manipulation of the brain. Right now, everybody, even the stupidest, uh, less, least connected person on the internet is worried that they are being told something that is not true and is making them vote maybe for the wrong kind of decision, Brexit. Uh, and that's scary. And I would say people are not stupid and they're not just moral entrepreneurs huh? because the panic spreads to a whole population. So it's wider than that. And it's about this uh, political moment when people are deciding we've been tolerant, it's okay, it's not really hurting me, etc. Now it's hurting everybody, it's hurting my children, it's hurting my, my government, so I'm, I'm stepping my foot on it. And it's because the, the social media have trespassed, and they've trespassed the status quo. They're trespassing the status quo for us researchers. My fear about fake news is that it's going to touch research. And I don't want the results I've presented to you there be presenting as opinions. They're not opinions, what I've been telling you. Okay? And I've given you all the tools to contradict me. I've showed you my biases, they're stated, uh, the, the ways I have solved the, the perceived biases. I'm giving all the tools to be contradicted, to have a contradictory debate. Fake news doesn't do that. This is how you know it's fake. You have to take it at face value and you can do nothing else. But we as researchers and journalists in some ways are researchers though they sometimes think they're like us, they're not, but anyways, um, they are doing the same thing. And I think the, the idea that some things remain facts, something remain research results, I think it's important to, to all of us. And, and uh, the procedures, the protocols for it have to be put forward. So we're reinventing it for the journalists, the fact checkers, what are they doing? The same thing as the editors were doing before. They are recreating the trash can. This is not good. <laughs> voilà. Well, I th just to come back, I mean, I, I think... Quickly. Having said that, we need to be careful about moral panics, yes? I'm not, panics. I'm not sure that moral panic Media is a very panics. useful... I mean, I use that term <laughs> myself. I'm not sure it's a very useful term, partly because it always assumes that there are other people out there who are, who are crazy, whereas, of course, we are, we are rational. They're panicking and we're, we're rational. But I think there are issues that we really need to be careful and critical about because a moral panic frames an issue in a particular kind of way. Why is it that certain sets of concerns rise up the public agenda? How is it that those concerns are defined? The issue of framing, this, this idea of framing is quite interesting. When we talk about fake news, for example, what do we not talk about? If we, if we choose to frame the problem in that way as a problem of truth versus falsity, what are we not talking about, yes? And I think always we've got to be addressing that, what's outside of the frame. Um, and I think the other issue is also, well, what do we do as a result of these concerns? So in the 1950s, moral entrepreneurs went around the United States and got young people to bring their comics together and they were publicly burned. Yes. Now we have, in fact, this just this past week, the government in the UK is proposing to have some kind of legal restriction on the amount <coughs> of time that children should be spending on social media. Yes. Now we all know that screen time, there is no magic number, that it depends on what you do, where you do it, how you do it with. But no, what the government wants to do in response to the way in which this issue is framed, that it's a question of quantitative screen time, what they want to do is to institute a particular figure. Um, and so I think there are, we need to be asking those critical questions. What's in the frame? What's not in the frame? What actions are, are, this, are these kinds of concerns going to lead to? Yeah, I think in that, in that whole realm of quick fix solutions, I just think it's a horrifying scenario. Yeah. There was a famous, there was a famous, there was an interview in the Spanish newspaper two months ago about this digital diet, you know, a two hour digital diet, mm. um, as if there was the real vi the viability of that. Yeah. I would really uh, like to see it. Mm. Um, yes, but there is a whole range of measures that is proposed, not one. One of them at the moment is taxing the GAFA. Mm. which is never something we reached until now. And now they're actually willing. 
since there's been the credible threat in France of a law on fake news, suddenly Google is saying, we pay taxes in France, we bring research and development, artificial intelligence, we're going to hire French people in France. So yes, there's a whole range, and that's why, for instance, for me, uh, media panics are a research area of media and information literacy as a field. It is a valid research area because it has uh, consequences, it has um, a lot of uh, implications, some uh, that are good, some that are bad, etc., etc., and that continue evolving. But usually they end up with some kind of intervention in a policy realm that was not possible before the panic. Ah. Okay, we've got five minutes left. Um, this is for Divina, this is for you. Ah. Despite, uh, that's a bit similar to what's come up. Despite the freedom of citizen, the freedom in inverted commas of citizen participation, there is the fact that most publications come from the same group, and there's also the filter of Facebook, Google, etc. Should we be teaching this at school? Should we be teaching uh, the ideological and economic interests of these groups? I think it's a big weakness in, in media and information literacy, maybe not in the UK. Uh, but in many European countries, uh, we, we do not teach uh, about consumption. Mm. Uh, we are heavily biased, if I may say so, in the field of media and education literacy towards citizenship and creativity. That's what schools like to do. And because teachers are not often trained in economics, um, they, they can't bring uh, this, uh, this whole dimension of the law and of the economics of, of media and information literacy. So I think we, we have to really rebalance them, all the, the competences within the, the package of uh, media and information literacy competences, because in terms of consumption, we are, we are weak. Uh, we, uh, we take it for granted or we think it's happening outside the school because schools usually in Europe leave the market at the door no vending machines, no this, no that. Uh, it's contrary to the United States, where, in fact, media literacy, its biggest paradigm there is advertising and consumption. Uh, in Europe, uh, because of the way our schools are structured and because of the way we, are, we, we think, um, it's, it's, uh, it's not done. And, and it's a real weakness, uh, because it doesn't help them, us as citizens, to act on ownership, uh, act on monopolies, uh, ask for accountability and <coughs> transparency. It doesn't create some of the uh, uh, direct uh, um, habits uh, as uh, citizens uh, in terms of, uh, in particular, accountability and, and transparency. Again, as David was saying, it puts the burden on us. We have to be accountable, we have to be transparent, etc. And, and we don't ask it of um, uh, the, the media, media field. So, yeah, I think we have um, some still some work to do there. Again, it does mean that our field is a real field uh, that needs more development uh, and more concentration on, on weaknesses and strengths. Two left. One from Venezuela, which is for you, David. What happens when media literacy public policies are an undercover costume for censorship? <laughs> Who draws the line and where is the limit? <laughs> You take it. Nice easy one for you. <laughs> well, thanks for that, yes. Um, <laughs> well, in some ways, I, I think what I was saying in a way that, that was that media literacy as, as communication policy often becomes actually not the same as censorship, not a cover for censorship, but almost a kind of good liberal alternative to censorship, yes? That in some ways, and I, I mean, the word censorship is, is, again, a term we need to take mm -hmm. considerable care with. Um, but I would say that the logic for media literacy in terms of, of communication policy, as I said, is very much about empowering the consumer. It doesn't actually address those questions about you know, what kind of content we're getting and how, how reliable is it, and, and so on. So I'm not, I would see, in many ways, media literacy policy as an alternative to censorship. And certainly, you know, it's presented as an alternative to regulation. I actually think, I'm, yes, I'm not happy with censorship, but I'm certainly happy with regulation. And I think we need both of those things. 
Are you not going to say something on this? Or? I want to hear the last question. Last question. <laughs> <laughs> and you can choose. It's the, co it's choose. the coffee moment is approaching. <laughs> this is from Portugal. It's like Eurovision Song Contest, isn't it? it so is. Our next question is from Portugal. Good evening, Lisboa. Um, Dana Boyd recently put it to the fore that media literacy, as it is presented to students, might be dangerous. Decoding mechanisms of media creation might not be enough. So where are we to go next to empower our students? Do you want me to read that again? Can I ask no. for a joker? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Decoding I, mechanisms of media creation might not be enough. Where are we to go next in order to empower our students? It's complicated. I would have to say that to be as polite as possible, I'm not convinced that Dana Boyd really knows what she's talking about. Um, this, if people don't know, she, she is, she's a, works at the Microsoft Research uh, Facility. She published a blog called Did Media Literacy Backfire? in which she seems to place the blame for fake news, etc., on too much media literacy. And I kind of think, well, if we had too much media literacy, that would be a very interesting place because actually we don't have enough media literacy. Um, and I'm not really convinced, this, I'm probably saying this, it's probably going on the internet <laughs> as we speak. Hi, Dana. But actually, I don't really think that when she talks about media literacy, she seems to be talking about media literacy education. I don't really think she un that's what she's referring to. So actually, I think she's really quite confused about, about what she's arguing. And she's had a lot of comeback from the media literacy community in, in the US who've challenged a, a lot of, of what she's saying. I mean, I, I think, you know, there is, there is a, a little kernel, and if she is saying this, then I, I agree. It, it goes back to the point I was raising about trust, because I think there is a danger of too much media literacy, you know, as if. But if there was, you know, if, if media literacy was actually ending up making people cynical, and making people distrust um, everything they see and hear, then that would be a problem. But I don't think we're in that place at all. Yeah. Okay. Davina. Yeah, it's like, just like you don't teach about advertising so that people stop consuming advertising. Mm -hmm. That's not our purpose in education, right? Uh, you can actually derive even more pleasure because you know the tricks, huh? and then it's part of the uh, uh, Colombo effect. Huh? You know about who's been killed, so it's fun to see how Colombo finds out about the killer. Okay, that's what <laughs> media literacy is about in some ways. Um, so, but, but, but what David was saying is a, is a is real issue about uh, the dangers of, of capture of media literacy at the moment uh, because of a big uh, um, uh, publicity it's being given is, is uh, the risk of lack of independence uh, of us researchers, especially if lots of state disengage uh, and money is being disengaged from public schools. So I want a fund, I want to tax the GAFA for the problems they've caused. I want a fund that goes for education and part of it, 1%, okay, 7%, exactly the fall on the market. 7% goes billion. to media and information <laughs> literacy. Your numbers are very interesting. So we don't have to ask much, but the fund would do what? The fund would neutralize that money. It's not the direct arm um, of internet, of, of Google or of Microsoft, etc., acting on the researcher. And so the researcher may be able to say, well, Microsoft is breaking the status quo. Microsoft is substituting itself to uh, education. In France, Microsoft did a treaty, literally a treaty, with the, the, the Ministry of Education. And I, and, it, and I wrote a blog, talking about blogs, I wrote, it's not the fault of Microsoft. Why did our Minister of Education sign a treaty with Microsoft, not even putting an end to it, you know, not even a four or five years, no, ad vitam aeternam? Who is to blame here? Who is not having the education? So I really worry very much about uh, independence. And again, the, the, thing, the thing about uh, Dana, hi Dana, uh, is that, um, 
She's right in the sense that we don't have a real evaluation of male. Mm -hmm. That's true. And it's partly normal because education, you know, is for life. And uh, maybe you'll become a better consumer 10 years after school. But we have a problem with that evaluation because it's nowhere right now, which is why I'm pushing for PISA. There has to be a way of saying, we're doing it, these schools are doing it, this is how they're doing it, let's compare with others, etc. let's stimulate each other, et cetera, et cetera. Right now, male, if you look at it in America in particular, in other places, it's all about good practices. I am against policy making by good practices. Because that is not a policy, it's a practice. And a practice lasts, oh, somebody is censoring me, uh, a practice lasts the time of a person who does a practice. It doesn't transfer, it doesn't scale up. We, now we are in need of scaling up. It's enough playing around the bush. It's, it's you know, we have plenty of trumps around. It, it's time to scale up and to make it part of a core curriculum. There's no other way. And then you'll have evaluation, and then Dana can be proved right or wrong. Right now, she is, it's her word against my word, it's fake news. <laughs> a la Trump. On that note. Uh, oh no, please, say something else. <laughs> no, 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 no. Quickly, quickly. Um, on that note, I'm getting wild arm-waving instructions from the organizing committee to bring this to a close. So on behalf of the Transmedia Literacy team, um, I'd like to say a big hand to, to David and to Davina for a fantastic Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're done.